So it's now my pleasure to welcome the first session of the morning, a panel discussion with leaders in quantum information science and engineering, moderated by another leader in the field, Dr. David Stewerman. David is a director of academic and national lab partnerships at the quantum computing hardware and software company, IonQ, having moved there relatively recently from the Kavli Foundation. Thank you very much. Is 
It's, um, it's a limited liability company that's co-owned by General Motors and Boeing. Um, we perform research on behalf of our owners, who of course have their own kind of research capabilities, but we kind of look kind of beyond their headlights, kind of doing um, more long-range research. Um, and in fact, um, more than half of our research budget comes from contract research and development with the US government. Um, the work that we do is what I would say is use-inspired basic research. So we're somewhere in between the work that takes place at, at a university or at an institution like the CME and um, you know, something that's like full-fledged manufacturing. Um, and I'm really happy uh, to be able to participate in this wonderful um, panel this morning. I would obviously love to be with you guys um, locally, but also happy to participate virtually. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. It's, it's cool to learn more about HRL. Um, Jerry, uh, please introduce yourself. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, David. Um, my name is Jerry Chow. Uh, I'm the director of Quantum Hardware Systems and Development at IBM Quantum. Uh, based in uh, at the TJ Watson Research Center in Westchester, New York. Uh, really excited to be with you all today to, uh, to, to have this panel and, and, and congrats again to the University of Chicago for this 10 year anniversary. Uh, with regards to um, IBM Quantum, our, our goal is really to uh, provide uh, managed services, managed quantum services over the cloud, right? So, our, our focus is on uh, quantum computing, uh, the, the full stack um, uh, of, of quantum computing from the uh, device fabrication and, and, and device processors all the way to the system integration, system deployment, uh, all the way up the stack through, through software and how it's actually um, used by a very, very diverse and broad community of users. And uh, our, our um, vision for Quantum really is that uh, we wanted to be frictionless in terms of how it's used in computing in general, right? That today people use use uh, cloud services uh, for for uh, challenging problems, and we want Quantum to be uh, another facet of that, right? And um, a big part of that though is really to focus on um, a, a, the the uh, roadmaps to get there, right? There's there's certainly a lot of work to be done in all aspects of the stack from uh, the hardware side in terms of building better and better processors, scaling them up, improving their quality, uh, integrating things like error correction over time, uh, while also making sure that there's a uh, really stable um, capability with, uh, with systems that are managed and the software that, that users are able to develop on. And this means uh, having open source resources like uh, our Qiskit framework, uh, allowing users to um, basically program quantum computers at a very low level, uh, all the way up to programming quantum computers basically for uh, application demonstration in machine learning, in, in chemistry, and all kinds of new areas that are very, very interesting, I think, to, uh, to, to the world. Uh, so overall, that's, that's kind of what we're uh, driving for today. We have over 20 uh, service, uh, full systems that are been deployed over the cloud. Um, and we're working towards uh, improving the metrics and driving improvements of, of our systems over time and really looking to foster a vibrant community uh, throughout hardware, uh, throughout software, and the entire ecosystem. Remarks. So what I thought was very funny in this opening remarks is that, you know, well, 10 years ago, no one knew University of Chicago and the PME was going to be, you know, great for quantum information science and engineering. And I got a chuckle because the amount of talent that the University of Chicago and folks that have amassed it in, uh, at the PME, there was no doubt that the PME and University of Chicago was going to be a leader in quantum information science. So I thought, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but so I'll, I'll talk for just a moment. So um, yeah, I in fact was a postdoc for David Alshon when he was in Santa Barbara. Uh, my background, I have a PhD in chemistry and work in condensed matter physics. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, be a chemistry professor, see what life was like in the academic world. Uh, I did that at the University of Victoria in Canada. Um, there, I, I kind of blended molecular electronics, which was an incredibly exciting hype field in the early 2000s, with uh, quantum information science and spintronics. So it was an interesting merger. Um, then I took my career in a different direction and worked in. Uh, I had an opportunity to also work at a think tank in DC, learn a little bit about how the government works, and that was exciting. And now, uh, thank you, and excited to work in a, in a new hardware space, pursuing quantum computing in a di slightly different way than what some of our panelists will probably talk about today. Um, but again, incredibly exciting stuff. I want to move on to our questions.
questions, but also remind you to please submit your own questions. We have uh, some planned topics to discuss that I know we're going to be interested start with Linda and talk a little bit about what's the role of basic science and basic research and government in quantum information science and engineering today. Um, Linda, please go ahead. Great, Dave. Thank you for that question. I think everyone would agree um, that basic science was the key to where we are today and it's going to be the key to where we are in the future. I mean, we can't stop investing in basic science and I think the government, whether it's NSF, DOE, NIST, or all the other agencies that have a, a, a vested interest in, in making quantum a reality uh, for the things that we need for national security and, and, and just the, the good of our nation going forward, um, that's not going to change. What I'd like to add is our new NSF director, Dr. Punch, um, has a really great vision for the foundation where it's not just about the basic science that needs to be created, but it's about uh, innovating with it and also those innovations feeding back and generating new fundamentals questions so that we can keep ahead of the game. And I think uh, uh, our, our distinguished client, uh, uh, our distinguished guests here on the panel will also talk about the short and long term. Uh, we have you know some 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 long term new developments every day that David Oshalom alluded to that I'm getting an echo, I'm sorry. Do you hear that? Do you think they can fix that? Okay, great. great. Yeah, so David alluded to the fact that every day we learn something new, um, whether it's in the area of topological physics or in how we can control uh, um, entanglement and, and uh, coherence. Um, we're learning things every day with all the new investments, investments that we have. have. But, I'd but I'd like to like just to tell you, you. <sighs> okay, they, they need, need to fix, fix that, that again. again. Okay. okay, so um, how did this all start? I think uh, about five years ago when uh, we realized that there were so many great advances in, in fundamental science, it was time uh, to start working across disciplines, not just within the condensed matter physics field and chemistry and, and other physics, but with engineers and computer scientists to really think about the whole entire system as Jerry was alluding to. And so that's when we uh, initiate a quantum leap. Uh, and of course that uh, was also uh, uh, initiated due to the international competition. I mean, we saw the EU with its quantum manifesto. We saw the increase in, in government industry and Google and, and Microsoft and IBM, of course. And so we knew that it was time to make a major investment in quantum. And of course, soon after Quantum Leap in 2018, um, Denise Caldwell, our division director for physics, who's on the subcommittee for quantum information science, uh, was part of the, the st strategy that came out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy that eventually led to the National Quantum Initiative, which is what we have today. So I think, you know, it's no longer about having physicists conducting cool experiments and trying to understand spooky phenomena. I think we're starting to get a handle on some of these things. And the only way that we're going to be able to harness it is to, to work across disciplines and work across sectors. Um, and I think uh, you see that as part of the regional capabilities uh, led by the University of Chicago. So um, I just want to add one more thing. Um, you know, the, just last week, there was a quantum day held at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, there were old, over 100 representatives from federal agencies, and they discussed everything, not just about the technology, but the, the education, the training, and so there's a huge government effort to support both the fundamental research and the technology development going forward. And, and the other thing that David alluded to that obviously is, is very important to NSF is we are uh, working to find ways to reach the untapped uh, talent at our institutions that are our two institutions, minority serving institutions and HBCUs, because we feel that that's going to be incredibly important to bring everybody into the fold in order to really bring all the great ideas forward. So I'm just going to end with the fact that, you know, with NSF in the new fiscal year, October 1st, is creating a new director called Translation Innovation and Partnerships. And I think um, the quantum investments that we had so far in basic science are going to benefit from that and hopefully we'll partner with uh, some of the people on this this call today. So thank you, David, for giving me an opportunity to answer that question. Thanks.
Thanks, Linda. Um, Matthew, I know you mentioned that you're kind of at this bridge point between the basic science and the slightly more applied. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective uh, in this area? Sure. So, yeah, as I was saying before, um, HRL is kind of in the business of what we call like transition. So trying to take, you know, sometimes what you would see, you know, when you read like a, a physics research paper, like in PRL, you know, in the, in the introduction, there's all these statements about this could lead to this or that technology. I mean, and there's kind of followed by a proof of principle demonstration and HRL's job as a company is basically to understand what it takes to go from that proof of principle demonstration into something that's real. Um, and so we usually we do, you know, do that kind of work on behalf of, of government customers and, and our work in the quantum area is in that in that vein. So, um, you know, we work in an area of um, these spin qubits. This is an area that kind of um, was born out of a lot of, of kind of three, five materials physics in the 90s. You know, people looking at like the Hall effect and two dimensional electron gases and things like that. Um, and then people being realizing that they could use nanofabrication to make really small features where they could trap these electrons. Um, then people started when they were examining, you know, how good could this system work? One thing that they realized pretty soon is that if you're looking at a spin qubit, it's, it's beneficial if the nuclear spins that are around your, your, your spin of interest are spin zero, right? That they don't have any nuclear spin. So there was an interest kind of right away that, you know, could we do similar kind of quantum dot physics in silicon material systems? And so um, that's where HRL really um, came to play was, was investigating the silicon implementation of these, these quantum dot qubits. And the challenge there is that it comes down to an effective mass problem. The fact that the mass, an effective mass of an electron in silicon is heavier than in a 3-5 system means that if you want to confine your electrons, you have to make all of your stuff a lot smaller. All of your features need to be really, really quite small. Um, and that was, that's a really big challenge. And, and I think one of the reasons that, that HRL was able to be successful in this particular area was kind of a combination of kind of like an academic research mentality of using electron beam lithography to get really small feature sizes, but at the same time, having kind of um, a clean room that, that has a lot more of the kind of manufacturability sophistication and and kind of professionalism attached to it. So, you know, when I was in grad school, it was, you know, physics grad students running the E-beam tool. Here at HRL, it's, you know, someone who did their PhD in, in electron beam lithography running the E-beam tool. Um, and the other big piece of it is, is that, um, you know, in developing this kind of technology, and, and I think is, this is true of most quantum technologies, that you're really dependent both on the fabrication and on the materials. So you need to have really good materials to be able to do really anything interesting in this area. Um, and that's where we had um, quite a bit of investment and in kind of previous understanding. How do you make, you know, high mobility materials in these kind of silicon two-dimensional electron gas systems? Um, and, and it was from there that we were able to make a lot of uh, really um, amazing progress. So since I've been here over the past eight years, I think about where we were when I started and where we are now, you know, I think... It's been it's been really remarkable, and then it's really kind of a combination of that kind of engineering um, discipline, but also the kind of flexibility that you kind of want to have in in a, in a place of you know a lot of innovation, like you think of at a clean room in a university. Um, and so um, you know one thing about HRL is you know we're doing a lot of you know contract research and development for the government, but we also um, you know, try to support the spin qubit field in the academic world by providing materials and devices. You know, as I said before, like, you know, the, the doing good quantum device research in this area is incre increasingly dependent upon materials and fabrication facilities. And I think it's not reasonable to expect that, like, a new professor at a university is going to be able to stand up a capability to fabricate devices of this complexity. And so they need to be able to partner with industrial people like me or, or somebody else like, like Jerry, who can, you know, provide the hardware side. Um, I think that that, that can really benefit um, the community as a whole. And I think that's kind of the direction things are moving in is from my vantage point anyway. Awesome. So David, awesome. can I just kick, kick something in there, um, Matt, that, you know, one of the, uh, we're, the NSF is responding to that by funding of two uh, quantum leap materials foundries. Um, one was stood up at UC Santa Barbara. The second one is uh, being stood, stood up at, um, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Montana, uh, University of Montana, Montana State University. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I'm hoping that, uh, that, that, that 
organizations like yours and, and industry will interface with them. That's part of what they're being stood up to do. And just like you is to share uh, materials and device concepts. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, Matthew, thank you very much. Jerry, so could you tell us a little bit about basic science at IBM? I mean, I know that IBM does a lot, but at this point, what could you tell us about the basic side? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, uh, uh, a lot of our entire program has has emanated from uh, the basic uh, uh, research into quantum with, uh, you know, foundational principles from Charlie Bennett, uh, the earlier work with uh, NMR, uh, quantum processors in, in, in Almaden Research Lab. But today, really, the way that it, it fits in is that um, uh, it's, it's a, an entire uh, collection of, of research and development, right? And so the basic research still, uh, side still absolutely needs to, to feed into our uh, development roadmap. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the whole point there is that we, we define our roadmaps many years into the future, right? So probably for the, for the next decade, we already have at least uh, you know, some proposals for what we are planning to integrate with our systems. Uh, and a big part of that is to make sure that we are um, uh, uh, covering the research elements that need to feed into that, even at a, at a very fundamental level. Uh, so one thing that I can certainly point to is, is in fact, with, uh, uh, with, with the Ch Chicago Quantum Exchange, for example, in, in engaging in some very uh, basic research elements of looking at things like transduction, right? So uh, even though we're building quantum systems today that are kind of uh, monolithic in their nature in the future, they might be modular, right? And so there's a, there's a, there's some thought in terms of how, how we might actually uh, develop ways to uh, transmit quantum information between different modules with 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 photonic transduction, uh, and that type of stuff is exactly along the lines of basic research that we see that needs to continue, right? Uh, other elements besides that it, it are not just even within uh, experimental space, but but uh, the the theory side too, right? Like we we have a lot of great um, uh, error correction codes that 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 are that are out there, but uh, what are what will be the ultimate ones that that get developed? A lot of that is still going to be uh, uh, fundamentally driven through 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 theory research, and and you know a big part of that is is going to be centered around. Uh, uh, collaborations with, uh, with 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 NSF with various uh, universities to to drive that forward. Jerry, I was going to stick with you. So maybe to go into the more applied side, you know, what's it like? Now you you came from a, a, a an academic lab, but what's it like to work in industry today if you're in quantum? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, you, you know, being in this industry is. Uh, um, it's it has it has a lot of things that are very much uh, aligned and and uh, common to what 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 uh, one might experience in in academia, uh, but then there are a lot of things that are certainly uh, different, right? But um, uh, a lot I would say that uh, the 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 collegial nature, the the type of collaboration, the discussions are certainly very very academic, especially as we need to drive um, uh, scientific results with the systems that we're building. Uh, but then I think from an industry standpoint, what we do have the ability to do is bring in some of that uh, 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 engineered aspects of, of, of development, right? Like uh, nitty gritty, uh, repetitive uh, cycling of devices or characteriz characterization of devices until you find good ones. Um, having the ability to have very, very stable fabrication processes that are, you know, um, that are process monitored. Uh, you know, with a lot of the the deep background, entrenched knowledge and know how of of, of tool users from uh, silicon silicon days, right, of silicon development uh, that we have it in in uh, in our eight, eight inch fabrication line at at um, um, at, at, at IBM. Uh, so it's 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 definitely different, right? So you have this um, more uh, applied mentality um, targets in terms of deliverables that we are we are all marching towards. Uh, but at the same time, maintaining that uh, academic um, insight into how to drive improvements, uh, how to understand the underlying physics or chemistry uh, so that we can uh, move forward. Matt, Matthew, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I guess just to follow on what Jerry was saying, it, you know, it really is is a balance because, you know, we're, I, I like to think of what we're doing is, you know, it's very like applied physics, right? Like, you know, trying to make the devices better, like increase their performance is both a combination of kind of understanding kind of 
more like academic, -y, you know, root, root physics level things. But then a lot of it comes down to, you know, how your discipline on the engineering side, which is, you know, having very stable um, fabrication processes. You know, you want to make sure that, you know, it's not just like, like in, when I think about like life, at least when I was in grad school uh, on the in kind of quantum information, it was like, if you had a good device, you would just sit on that thing and you would met, you know, it would be in your dill fridge for like months and right. And you would just milk that thing and, you know, try to get all the physics that you can out of it. But that that's not, you know, that's not an acceptable answer in the industry, right? You're trying to actually make a technology. So it can't, you have to be able to show that, you know, you understand what's going on and you can reproduce what you've done before. Um, and so I think that that's one of the big differences is kind of that that mentality that you know this this has to be reproducible. We have to understand what the limitations are from the manufacturing side if, if this is going to become a real thing or not. Um, I guess some of the other things that that are maybe different aside from like um, engineering things is like yeah the kind of the focus on the goals, right? Um, you kind of have like a set of milestones and markers. You have a roadmap that you're kind of marching to, and what, what you're doing at every step of the way is understanding if the things that you're measuring are consistent with with your plan you know does does your map make sense in terms of how you're going to make these devices better or not and so it's less about like oh this is really cool we should publish this and go talk about it and it's more like you know analyzing all of the results in the context of your strategic plan like does it make sense is the are you converging to something that 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 was better than where you were before Awesome. Yeah, it's a great comment about the hero devices. Yeah, I think really dialing in processes in in industry versus what you did in the clean room as a grad student is a very different, di very different world. Um, Linda, I was wondering, so we heard a little bit about what industry needs and what they're doing. Uh, and I know there are tons of programs that the, the many agencies in the government are supporting. Could you tell us a little bit about how the government is preparing students for these careers in industry? Yeah. Um, thank you for that question, David. And, and um, you know, th this is this is going to be key because you're going to have to have the workforce to to take on uh, all these challenges in the future. So I think early on, the first thing that that NSF did uh, when we when we launched the Quantum Leap was we initiated a quantum science summer school because we uh, we knew that uh, you know there's not every place uh, 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 institution across the United States that has the idea that that PME has of bringing different disciplines together under one school to look at problems like quantum. And so we wanted to provide an opportunity to have a summer school for students that come from computer science, that come from condensed matter physics, uh, come from chemistry, so that they could share and learn some of the common vocabulary of industry. And so industry was a major participant of that. Um, and DOE, Department of Energy, BES, and uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research helped to support it also. That ran for several years, and, and that inspired us to go even further um, in working with your own David Oshalom uh, in creating the first triplets program that he alluded to, which is a way to bring a student and a, a PI that's working in the quantum area uh, uh, together with an industry or national lab partner. And it's in a way to really, you know, give the student and, the, and, and actually the academic uh, researcher, uh, uh, the professor, some real world experience about what it takes that the types of things that Matthew and Jerry were talking about when you really have to think about the application and, and push it forward. It's a lot different. So we're trying to get students to see that much earlier. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, uh, the, the small amount of money that NSF put in initially for triplets has been uh, compounded uh, by a number of industry partners. And, and, and of course, David it, it should be congratulated for that. We've got over 70 triplets so far. Um, and through the Quiznet uh, part of University of Chicago that, that kind of monitors all these things. So I think it's a wonderful program and we hope to expand it. The other thing uh, that, that has become really important, our own, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Tomas Durkowitz um, is working with the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, uh, with respect to education. And, and they've actually have been working on this um, ideas for on-ramping, retraining, and, and doing informal education, but also, you know, managing what they're calling the National Quantum, uh, excuse me, Q12 Education Partnership. Uh, that if you're interested in that, it's called Q12 Education. And there's all kinds of activities and curriculum development because we really need to start, I think government feels, and if you, you look at the most recent um, statistics in regards to math, 
performance. If students that are going to eventually go into these fields and be prepared need to have good math skills, and, and, and the U.S. is really, really far behind. So we really have to start really early. And interestingly enough, they're really trying to teach quantum intuition, you know, to K through 12 teachers. And so if you go to um, the, the link q12education.org, you can see what's going on, what's being led by the government, and you can participate. Um, there is a link that you can hit that says get involved, and if you click on it, there's ways that you can participate, whether you're from industry, um, your students are working on things, uh, your other professors, or even uh, the general community. So I think um, the government has a lot of exciting things, and there's plenty of things if you go to the OST, but P, excuse me, OSTP website um, that links to some of these new activities that are being supported by all the federal agencies that are involved in the National Quantum Initiative. So I hope that was helpful. Do you have any yeah, questions? Yeah, it was. <laughs> I, I should also chime in. Um, Emily Edwards, I know, is working on Q12 issues as well. And she's <sighs> in Urbana-Champaign. She's doing a great job. Um, so no, really exciting. And thanks for, thanks for filling us in. Um, I was wondering if I could also pivot, you know, maybe we'll, we'll start with Matthew. Um, you know, if, if someone's going to come, a student's interested in working at, at a place like um, HRL, um, what are they, you know, how can they prepare? What, what do they need to, to know how to do so that they can be productive uh, at somewhere like HRL? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So, so I'll answer that in a second. But one thing I wanted to, to say to just follow up on, on what Linda was talking about was that I think um, last year or two years ago, you know, we had a number of our more junior staff. This is people that that are either like bachelor's, master's level staff scientists and engineers, and also folks that kind of came from outside of the quantum area, participate in some, uh, some of the winter and summer schools that have been um, supported by the NSF, both at mm -hmm. UCSB and at the University of Chicago. And you know, this has been, this is really helpful for um, right. kind of allowing some of the more junior staff to get exposed to you know, quantum efforts aside from you know, what we're doing here on the, the exchange only spin qubit side. Also give them, yeah, giving them that exposure is, is, is really helpful and um, that kind of like retraining aspect of things. Um, so I really appreciate um, NSF's, NSF's support of those kinds of programs. So um, great to hear, Matthew. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, no problem. Um, so on the, um, you know, what can people do to prepare themselves? Um, it's a good question. So, um, um, you know, as someone who who interviews, you know, many many candidates every year, you know, to work on a program like this, um, I can tell you, you know, what it, what is it that I'm looking <coughs> for when I'm interviewing these people, and and it really isn't like a domain knowledge really that mm -hmm. that I'm really looking for, like someone who knows a lot about spin qubits. I mean, that's helpful. But I think what we're really looking for, you know, are people that, um, you know, have solved hard technical problems before and, and have like a good kind of logical sol problem solving approach where they're able to connect kind of their conceptual understanding of like what the experiment kind of should do, what should happen with what they actually measure. Because, of course, like in experimental science, like, you know, you never measure what you want to measure the first time. You spend all of your time solving problems. And at the very end, you kind of do the thing that you originally set out to do. And so kind of how do you get from the starting point to that end point really is kind of a, it's, you know, it's like a technical problem solving path. And it's really that set of skills that, that I'm looking for, you know, also looking for people that, um, you know, have kind of a pretty detailed understanding of kind of all aspects of their kind of complicated experiment. You know, you want people who are kind of bothered when they don't know the details of something. You know, they want people who um, kind of ask themselves the tough questions before someone else asks them. Um, I think that, um, yeah, so it's less about like, I want a job in quantum, so I should do quantum. And it's more about, you know, um, showing that you can work hard and solve, you know, difficult, challenging problems. Because, you know, I think as we'll talk about later, like the problems that, that quantum technology faces in the future aren't, you know, just physics problems or just mm -hmm. computer science problems, right? They span kind of a wide range. And you can expect that over the course of career, your career, you're going to work on a lot of different kinds of problems. Um, and we want people who can, who can kind of adjust and, and um, you know, dive in. Awesome. Thank, thank you for that perspective. We're going to go to Jerry in one second. I just also want to remind folks uh, to submit questions as well. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the audience, but I, I gather there is one. And so if there are questions, <laughs> I encourage you to, uh, to ask them and I'll, I'll be sure to, to deliver them to our panel. But Jerry, could you tell us a little bit about how to prepare for, for a job in quantum at IBM? Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, I'll echo some of what was just said there, but um, 
uh, today, I think with quantum, the the what we can capture in terms of talents from different fields is is very broad, right? And and that's that's what's phenomenal about where this field has gone. Uh, where certainly from the experimental side, uh, I can certainly point to many of those types of problem solving skills that um, that Matthew just mentioned as well. Uh, basically, to, to drive good experimental um, re research and good good experimental engineering practices. Um, but then I think what's what's phenomenal about uh, quantum today, especially with uh, uh, a very uh, vibrant developer community, is also just um, who, who can actually get involved from a software side um, and from um, you know from compiler work to uh, wanting to understand uh, how to build, you know, even new new uh, uh, quantum software operating systems. Right? There's a lot of a um, uh, lot of intrusion there of, of of talent that are maybe more from the traditional uh, CS uh, developer realm. Um, and then on top of that, now I think you're gonna have um, uh, other other sorts of I'd call it maybe more engineer traditional engineering that that gets involved, right? So besides besides computer engineering and and physics, you, you you're gonna have uh, double E microwave engineers, um, people who are good with their hands. Even like I, people who are really very good machinists are are also very very mm -hmm. stellar talents for uh, the work that we do. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that that's uh, that's really where 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 we're where we're headed, right? Where um, even in terms of like whether or not you need a PhD is 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 uh, is open now, right? In terms of we mm -hmm. we certainly hire a lot of people coming out of four year four year degrees, um, uh, and uh, a lot of it is is going to be um, a particular mindset, and then you 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 get trained in the skills, especially with regards to quantum, uh, after you actually you know get involved with it more. Awesome, thank you. I want to stick with this theme because I am getting I am getting some questions from the audience, and so awesome. they're they're related. I think both Matthew and Jerry have touched on them, but I want to go back and I'll go back to Matthew to start with. Um, so the question I have for someone working full time in a related field who has not not a quantum background, uh, what's the best way to get some knowledge from quantum information science so that they might be able to join the field? And I know we heard from Linda and your uh, your uh, positive approval of the winter school as school aspect. Um, but yeah, could you guys both elaborate? I'll start with Matthew on how to maybe pivot from a, you're a technical individual, but you want to move into quantum. What can they do? Uh, that's a really good question. I think that I guess I would probably advocate, you know, just, you know, looking around, like reading, right, trying to see what 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 is it that people are doing? What kinds of problems are they interested in solving? You know, that's kind of a probably combination of, of, you know, reading papers, but also, you know, I think we've moved a little bit away from like papers to press releases and, you know, you know, given the hype cycle of things. But I mean, really um, trying to connect with someone, I think would be help, especially if you're like, it's a completely, you know, you're completely away from this area, trying to connect with with someone, you know, at your university who works in it, just to try to understand Kind of what are the scopes of problems that people are interested in and then you can kind of reflect on okay what what are your own interests and experience like what what can you bring to bear against those problems and um that, that's what I, I that's probably what i would recommend would be kind of just like um getting some exposure and, and it would be ideal if you could find like a person who could who could kind of guide you um i think that would be really helpful awesome jerry jerry do you any anything to add yeah no i mean i think that well Kind of de depends on how how deep you want to get, right? But there's a lot of uh, open source content just to get started, right? There's uh, uh, go to kiskit.org and you. That's I mean I'll I'll push the the platform that we're we're developing on certainly, <laughs> but a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, material in terms of open source textbook to learn how to even program a quantum computer. You can run a quantum circuit on real hardware. Uh, so that you know, and then get get it get more and more exposed to different layers of the the full stack that way, uh, to the point that we even have uh, Kiskit Metal, right, which is a a tool for designing superconducting circuits in an open source way. So uh, there's a there's a lot of content that's out there uh, that allows uh, people to get involved from different different varying backgrounds, um, and I think that's that's a testament to just how much is. Um, uh, how much interest there is in quantum and and uh, uh, how much the, the whole field is really kind of rising in the last few years. Yeah. 
Awesome. I'll, I'll give a quick pitch because I think I have to. Uh, <laughs> INQ has something called the uh, Research Credits Program, where you just write like a one page proposal. Um, and it's for software driven, you know, you want to explore an application or do some science, you'll get access to uh, our cl cloud uh, quantum computers. And, you know, we're, we're doing our best to accommodate as many applications as we can so that folks can kind of Give it a shot and see where it goes and it's pretty risk-free so I'll, I'll just pitch that you can just look that up on the INQ and there are tons of great resources out there from from um, as you said open source textbooks and things of that sort so I think there are lots of things um, that can happen there so by my rough estimation we've got about five more minutes so more questions can come in wow. but I yeah I'm, at least that's what I've got by my stopwatch wow um, yeah but uh, I was going to go in and pitch uh, another question to to our group which I think let's, let's bring it back into the PME and talk maybe a little bit about, you know, what does the PME bring to the table uh, for the overall quantum effort? We've, we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, they, they're involved in lots of programs, um, but, you know, I wonder from your perspective, maybe we could, we could go around the table and talk a bit about, um, you know, what, what the PME has to offer. Uh, Linda, we'll start with you. That's great, Dave. As I told you, I, I had the pleasure of visiting, uh, <coughs> excuse me, faculty, and, and students and you know one of the great things about PME is that as I said before is it's not so rigid uh, disciplinary I mean they have everything and and as what Jerry and Matthew were saying is is you need to have people that that can understand across disciplines and solve problems and rather than focusing deeply on a domain science they're really focusing on problems and fine-tuning the do domain science that they're interested in and so I see um, it, it, it's a school that that really brings together and thinks about not just the the curriculum, but the innovation, um, the education, and the interdisciplinary part of the whole holistic uh, way uh, and approach of of doing research, which I think is what we need uh, for the nation going forward. So I think PME really reflects the types of things that NSF is is promoting with respect to convergence of disciplines in order to solve societal problems. And I really, really congratulate them in their 10th anniversary for being so successful doing it. Awesome. Um, and then I think, uh, Matthew, we're going to go to you. Thank you for the comments, Linda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess uh, following up on that, it's kind of like the first thing I think of is that, you know, we're always interested in hiring people. So, of course, the, the PME has been, been a, a great source of, of talent for us. Like, I think one of the people speaking in the alumni panel later today, Sam Whiteley, someone that that we hired, you know, someone that I visited with when I when I visited the PME um, a few years ago. So we definitely benefit from the just the generation of, of talent. Um, that comes out of the the PME. Um, we also, of course, benefit from the the winter school kind of and those kinds of opportunities for for our like junior staff to to engage with PME researchers and and kind of um, get some um, broader perspective in in quantum science. Um, we also engage with the PME directly um, in in areas of kind of mutual interest. Um, um, you know, we're an engineering and physical science institution, so there's a lot of of places where where we overlap directly, and um, I'll also note that one of one of our lab directors at HRL is on the board of governors of Argonne, and and you know so we have a lot of connections to the PME and the, the its kind of sister institutions. Um, I guess the last piece I would mention is that you know we you know we as a company at HRL on this this spin qubit effort you know we realize like we don't have the answers to all of these problems <laughs> right they're they're these problems are incredibly hard and you know we fully expect that you know a lot of the solutions are going to emerge out of out of places that support a lot of creativity and innovation you know institutions like the PME where like the attitude of kind of a cross disciplinary approach to problem solving is embedded and coupled with you know, strong support capabilities like a like top of the line like um, research and NF fabrication facility. Um, so th those are the main areas where I see um, the PME kind of impacting things. Awesome, Jerry, sure. ask you to comment. Yeah, and no, I mean just to, to probably reiterate a, a, what was already been said, but uh, a big part of it is 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 driving relationships that are uh, uh, kind of sharing of, 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 of students in some way, uh, educational in terms of um, uh, using similar resources for, for teaching, teaching the students, teaching classes. Uh, we, we're here to support a lot of that with, with, with a lot of the content that we have. 
uh, but also uh, in deeper deeper relationships like we've we've driven with uh, with with David with with other um, uh, efforts like the Chicago Quantum Exchange where we can have uh, basically, uh, shared postdocs for 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 certain areas of of research that are you know germane to our efforts, uh, but but certainly those are the those are the types of um, uh, ways of of having uh, this engagement between industry and and um, uh, institution like PME uh, from a very early stage to be able to to lay these you know seeds and foundational elements to uh, to drive the, our uh, drive the whole field forward basically. <clears throat> Yeah, awesome. I, I can say I also had the opportunity. I visited I visited the PME a, a couple different times. I visited David's lab, which is incredibly yeah. impressive. But the fabrication facility is amazing. Um, get that kind of accessibility to students and, and scientists. Some really incredible, uh, incredible things can happen. Um, yeah, I think we're we're mostly ready ready to wrap up. I was just going to comment on one thing. I'll put my my philanthropy hat on. I used to be a, a science program officer at the Catley Foundation, as David was kind enough to mention. And as you know, someone who wants to build scientific programs, um, you know, you're often looking for for excellence and and really how you evaluate your program um, and how what kind of case you bring to your board of directors who support your philanthropic portfolio, it's all about home runs. And I think, you know, after 10 years, there's really no doubt, which as, as a philanthropist, uh, you know, those home runs make your portfolio and the PME and what's kind of happening at Chicago is just, you know, really second to none. So my, my hat's off to them. Um, and so congratulations on your 10 year anniversary.